Rowe is absent. Bagley. Here. Harding. Here. Johnson. Here. Melton. Here. Palermo. Here. Mr. President. Here. Yeah. Please stand for the pledge and remarks by Councilmember Wanley Johnson. Um, I would like for everyone to continue standing, please. Um, it, it's with heavy sadness that on Sunday, October 24th, a pedestrian was traveling on Highway 75 in Hamilton in District 2, um, was met with a vehicle traffic injury and died. And so at this time, I would like for us to bow our heads for him and his loss and his family. Thank you. 30 seconds. Thank you. An affidavit of publication is on file for the pre-council and city council meeting and a current copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in a white binder on the east wall of the legislative chambers. Good afternoon and welcome to the Omaha City Council. We look forward to hearing your testimony today on our many items. I'd encourage you to turn your cell phones off or at least turn them to vibrate. Items six and seven can be considered together for Vistancia, located northeast of 216th and Fort Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item six, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat with waivers to section 5382B, cul-de-sac length, 53914 Green Corners, and 5383 Block Length. Item seven, a resolution to approve a waiver to the present development zone specifications of the urban development element of the City of Omaha Master Plan. Public hearing and vote on number six and seven is today. The applicant, please. <clears throat> Kyle Bull, uh, 10909 Mill Valley Road, DNA Consulting Group. I'm the engineer on the project here on behalf of Falcone Land Development. Uh, this project's located on the northeast corner of 216th and Fort. Uh, it's adjacent to the dam site 12, the new dam site 12. Uh, this is the third phase of our Vistancia project. Uh, this is 157 lots and grading is underway and uh, infrastructure going in uh, into the spring and summer of next year. Uh, Planning Board recommends approval and be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Any other proponents today? <coughs> Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Roll call. Bagley. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Items six and seven are approved, six to zero. Items eight through 10 can be considered together for Highlander East, located southwest and southeast of 29th and Burdett Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item eight, an ordinance to approve a major amendment to PUR Overlay District. Item nine, a resolution to approve the final plat. Item 10, a resolution to approve the subdivision agreement. Public hearing and vote on items eight, nine, and 10 are today. Proponents, please. Hi, my name is Terry Morrison with Earhart Griffin and Associates, 3552 Farnham Street. I'm here to represent the developer and the owner of Rinshore Development and 75 North. I can answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing's closed. Roll call. Bagley, Aye. Harding, Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Items eight through 10 are approved six to zero. Items 11 through 16 can be considered together for North Streams located northeast of 204th and Q Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Items 11 through 13 ordinances to rezone this property from AG District to DR District, R4 District and MU District. Item 14, an ordinance to approve a mixed use district development agreement. Item 15, a resolution to approve the final plat. Item 16, a resolution to approve the subdivision agreement. <coughs> Public hearing and vote on items 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 is today. The applicant, please. Yes, Mr. President, members of the council, Larry Jobin, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the developer and development. Uh, this is a 208 lot subdivision on the northeast corner of 204th and Q Street. Um, here to answer any questions. It'll be zoned R4, DR, and MU. So uh, it's a quite a large development, and this is just the final plat and rezoning of this uh, development. So here for questions. Thank you. Any other proponents today? 
Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Roll call. Bagley, Aye. Harding, Aye. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Items 11 through 16 are approved, six to zero. Item 17, an ordinance to rezone property located at 4810 South 15th Street from R4 District to R5 District. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend denial. B's communication in opposition. Public hearing and vote on number 17 is today. Is the applicant here? Any other proponents on number 17? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. And I wanted to ask planning a question about this particular agenda item. Uh, it did come with a denial from the planning board and planning department. Uh, could you elaborate uh, for us, please, on why this R4 was uh, denied, uh, changed it into an R5? Eric England, planning department. Um, this is an existing single family home. Um, the applicant is has intended to us that he would like to convert the building into a duplex. If this was rezoned to R5, it would not meet the lot size or lot width requirements that is needed in order to construct or, or um, redevelop into a duplex. So while R5 is technically master plan compliant, we feel it um, unnecessary to set up something that would need waivers from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, this neighborhood is very dense and we believe it's very consistent with single family homes and should remain that way. Okay, thank you. And that was my next question, to make sure that uh, this particular individual could still uh, develop a single family residence on this parcel of property. Uh, it is in my district. I did drive by this uh, property and uh, it, it would be very challenging, although uh, we do uh, hope uh, for higher density uh, in my district, especially with the letter that was sent, um, where a lot of the communication we heard uh, w was on point from the person that wanted to develop uh, this area. But unfortunately, um, there was a number left, and I reached out to this individual uh, and left a message uh, hoping to discuss and maybe work uh, with him on what the future plans would be. But I never re got a return call. So at this point in time, with the denials that we've received from the planning board and planning department, uh, if there's no other lights, I'd make a motion to recommend denial. There's a motion and a second. Councilman Harding, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to uh, note, in addition to um, Council Member Palermo's uh, comments about trying to reach out to the, the applicant who hadn't responded at, at planning board, um, no one uh, no one showed as a proponent or the applicant for the project, and I, I know here today that they didn't show as well, too. So Mr. Palermo tried to reach out and, and got no response, and so I, I support with the, his motion. Thank you. Roll call. Bagley. Well, this is to vote on the motion. To deny. To deny. Okay. So I would be deny. So, yes. Correct? Okay. <laughs> Aye. Thank you. Yep. Harding. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Item 18 to consider a Class C liquor license application for Mouth of the South located at 1111 Harney Street. Public hearing on vote on number 18 is today. The applicant, please. Uh, Ryan Ernst, 3422 Forest Lawn. Here to answer questions? Yep. Okay, I'm going to have a few for you. Um, so first we'll take any other proponents here today. Seeing none, any opponents? I'm not gonna close the public hearings. I think we'll have some questions for you and I, I may propose continuing the public hearing on this one, depending upon how you answer the questions, Ryan. So I appreciate you being here and I've always supported your restaurant. It's a great restaurant. Um, Mouth of the South used to be located in Florence and as folks know, uh, there was an unfortunate fire there for that, that left that property vacant. Mm -hmm. And it's still vacant. I think you since moved out to Lakeside? Yeah, I currently I sold that property, so it's not mine anymore. Okay. And the restaurant's currently at Lakeside out yes, west? Sir. Yep. And are you moving to a new location? No, we're a uh, second location. Second location, mm -hmm. okay. 
So who now does own that property in Florence? Um, I don't remember their company, but they're planning on building on it. I know that. I just don't know when. Okay. And when was that sold? Uh, about two weeks ago, I believe. Okay. Well, I, I still find that problematic. I mean, I'm glad it's sold, and I'm, I'm hopeful that something new can come in there. But that just happening two weeks ago, I mean, we've had a lot of concerns, and Florence has had a lot of concerns with that property over the last four or five years. Uh, here's, here's a picture of it from earlier this week, right? Mm. And so we've had you here before talking about the property and maintaining the property, which really didn't happen. Um, and we've had five now, um, actually six now, we had their complaints through the city. Um, they had to go through the process of a city inspector coming out to inspect the property, observing what I just showed here, and then having the city have to come out and enforce that mm. weed and litter violation uh, that was corrected by you, I think, twice, but mm. also twice by the city. And there's an outstanding um, warrant for it right now, too. Um, so, you know, I, we can check and double check who, who is now responsible for that if the property has, in fact, changed hands. But that doesn't excuse the fact that you had six violations in the last five years, right? Yes, sir. You want to address that? I was just, you know, trying to keep up on it on top of everything else. I mean, it's hard to get somebody down there that wants to do the work. It's a hard area to do. There's a lot of concrete structure in between. They can't get equipment through there. Um, it's just hard to get somebody to go down there and actually do it. And I would, I would understand that. And, and I think we gave, gave you some grace last time when, when that was the answer uh, mm -hmm. about a year ago. But things didn't, didn't improve. And, you know, the expectation is that people take care of their properties. Yes, sir. Especially in a sensitive place like a business district, a neighborhood business district. So that causes me a lot of concern. I, I have no, no doubt that your establishment and your restaurant is going to be successful. And I, I, I do wish you well with that. But I'm having real trouble with this one today, just given the history on that property and, and lack of follow through, frankly, um, on what I saw there. And, you know, complaints about every week from the neighborhood there. Um, Understood. And then when I was there, I took care of a lot of stuff that they weren't taking care of when the neighbors were around as well. So, I mean, we constantly have people dumping in that alley. I would constantly call somebody to haul stuff away, tires, batteries, furniture. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I took care of that all the time when I was there. Yeah, and that does sometimes happen on vacant lots, I understand. But, you know, every property owner has that responsibility. So, uh, I see there's another light on. I, I would feel better if we at least delay this by a week so we can clarify who does own, who does own the property and Understood. who is going to make this happen. So we don't send a city inspector out there every couple of weeks and we aren't having city resources being spent in that, in that regard and then having an upset neighborhood while we're trying to uh, get it accomplished. I'll stop my remarks for now. I see Councilman Bagley has his light on. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, Ryan, I, I know is a frequent in the past, I'd gone to Mouth of the South when I was down in Florence, mm -hmm. and is it a friends of mine that lived down there and they loved it. I had a friend that cooked there for years. Um, so I, I mean, looking forward to having you down in my district on 11th and Harney there. But I in discussing with President Fesserson this morning the concerns and the challenges you had of cleaning up that lot down in Florence there. Um, I can tell you on my short term on this council, listening to neighborhoods, and particularly the old market, they're really prideful on, on a clean downtown area, old market area. So I, I want to echo what, what Cal Council President Fesserson said, that it, it is a concern where that property down in Florence wasn't cleaned up. I know you're going to do great because you got a great restaurant down on 11th and Harney, but um, I will support Councilman Fesserson on that, that I think we got to make sure we get that cleaned up down on 30th Street down there before we go forward here. So that's my comments. Thank you. Might that be a motion? That is a motion, correct. Support you. So layover for one, one Layover week. for one week, yes. I'll okay. Motion and a second. Uh, Councilman Harding, you're recognized. Uh, thank you. I was just checking the assessor site real quick, and, and obviously time it, it lags a little bit, but um, I think it is still showing uh, Mouth of the South as the owner. But again, that's it, it takes a couple weeks for the assessor site to catch up with the, any transaction or any transfer deed. So I guess that's something we can check in the meantime too or confirm. But I have no reason to, to doubt that. All right, so I have the what, emails from yeah, the escrow company. Yeah, what Ryan says so is, is true. Company. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. 
Thank you. And I might just suggest before we vote here that you do just get us a, get us a confirmation on that sale. And more importantly, contact the new owner if it's his responsibility today to get this addressed and to have that cleared before next week. Okay, I'll do. All right, thank you. Motion and a second. Roll call. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Item 19, to consider a Class C liquor license application for Godega Market, located at 423 South 11th Street. Public hearing and vote on number 19 is today. Proponents, please. Hi, um, Council. My um, name is David Kerr. Um, address is 300 South 16th Street. Um, I'm the owner of this establishment, or one of, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Second. Roll call. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Thank you. Thank Item you. 19 is approved 6 to 0. Item 20 to consider a Class C liquor license application for Rookies Bar and Grill located at 1702 North 120th Street. Public hearing and vote on number 20 is today. Proponents, please. Uh, Mr. President, members of the council, Russ Dobb, uh, attorney for the applicant. Uh, the applicant's here. Uh, we would uh, stand by for comments and questions. Thank you. Uh, I think I could, Mr. Dobb, I don't think I got an address from you. Could you just put that for the record? Oh, excuse me. Uh, 2800 South 110th Court, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, suite number one. Great. Thank you. Any other proponents that want to speak today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Ms. Melton, you're recognized. Thank you. And Mr. Dobb, if you could come up. And I think new owner, if you want to. Hi. Hi. You just have to state your name and address. Neil Anding, 14923 Seward Plaza. Oh, thank you. And Neil, we the council did get one um, uh, opposition. <laughs> Sorry, I was distracted by something. Uh, we did get one uh, email in opposition from somebody that lives in the Candlewood 2 area, just kind of behind Rookies. Uh, and, and by the way, we haven't had any complaints. I think years ago, there were some noise complaints from the bar, but th those were taken care of, and I haven't heard anything since. Okay. Um, I know that you're a previous uh, business owner of Maplewood uh, Bowling Alley, correct? Manager. And I was a manager for 28 years. Man manager for 28 years. So. I'm looking forward to you um, coming in and, and taking over Rookie's bar. It's just down the street from my house, so um, I'm going to have to stop in in the next week or two. Uh, I'll bring my husband down because I think you, you've known bowler. him for many yeah. years. He used to bowl uh, in your bowling alley yep. for many years. But the opposition was, it, it appears that previously people were, after they left Rookie's at 2 in the morning, there was they stated that then they were going to Hertz Donuts that's open 24 hours. And so then we had apparently drunk people in the parking lot eating donuts and just maybe disturbing the neighbors. We talked earlier though, and it appears Hertz Donuts now closes at 9 p.m. That is correct, since we've been there October 1st. Since October 1st, yeah. and you've been closing at midnight? Well, my partner and I, before we bought it, were there for about eight months, just sort of seeing if it was something we'd be interested in. And we saw right away that it was a pretty cool place and neat place, but after 12, it just, turns a little different like you know mom says nothing good happens after midnight <laughs> so we decided what we're keying on is the family atmosphere and the food and everything so we decided to close at midnight just to eliminate that happening and it's worked I mean knock on wood but it's been very very awesome to see all the people supporting us and having the kids come in and eat and stuff so so we're going to close at midnight and I like the way that's been working for us I think that's great and a good family atmosphere so like we can we can bring our teenager with us, get them exactly. away from the video games, and come have a bite to eat at, at Rookies, and not feel like we're necessarily yeah. sitting in just a bar. Exactly, so, that's the uh, goal. Well, I appreciate that, um, and I want I just wanted to put it on the record since we did receive that opposition, and I wanted to clarify that those just aren't issues at this right. time. So thank, thank you. you, and with that, I'm going to motion to approve. All right, so. thank you. I think the motion is to include a suspension of Rule Seven. Oh, I forgot about that. Um, I'll move to suspend Rule Seven. That's because you're um, within so many feet of a city park. Um, 
we have to suspend that. It doesn't affect anything, but we have to suspend that and then vote. Same second. Yep. No further lights. Roll call. Begley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. I don't think we need a second motion, do we? No. Second? No, you do. Okay. There's motion and a second. Roll call. Be excused. Hold this here. Begley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Item 21, to consider a Class I liquor license application for Good Evans, located at 1040 South 74th Plaza. Public hearing and vote on number 21 is today. I believe we have the applicant by Zoom. Yes. <laughs> Ms. LaParco, you're recognized. Chelsea LaParco, my address is 1422 11th Avenue, Kearney, Nebraska. And I'm here with Good Evans to answer any questions. Great, thank you. We, we can barely hear you. <laughs> I'm just I'm just kidding, you're doing fine. <laughs> Are there any other proponents here today? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Public hearings closed. Motion to approve and a second. Roll call. Bagley, Harding, Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Item 22 to consider a Class D liquor license application for Aldi 42, located at 13215 West Center Road. Public hearing and vote on number 22 is today. We also have the applicant by Zoom. Mr. Kelly. Yes, Mr. President. Gotcha. Uh, Mike Kelly, 2804 South 87th Avenue, appearing here for Ollie's. This is this store will replace the store that's currently really basically across the street. And we're here for any questions you might have. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Is there a motion? Uh, Wave rule uh, seven. Second, roll call. Begley, Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Second. Roll call. Begley. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Item 23 to consider a Class D liquor license application for bottles and brews located at 10745 Mockingbird Drive. Public hearing and vote on number 23 is today. Also have this applicant by Zoom. There we go. I think you're hi, on. Michaela Barboza here. Yeah, sorry. Yep. <laughs> uh, Michaela Barboza, 1705 North 84th Street, and I'm the owner of Bottles and Brews LLC. I'm here to answer questions, right? Yep. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Uh, it's on the next one, sorry. No, I'll just make a motion to approve then. Second. Roll call. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Item 24, to consider a liquor license addition application for the Farnham Hotel, located at 1299 Farnham Street, to add an outdoor area. Public hearing and vote on number 24 is today. The applicant, please. Uh, Michael Sands, 1700 Farnham Street, on behalf of the applicant, the uh, Farnham Hotel. The application is for an expansion of the existing, existing license. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. And the uh, general manager from the Farnham Hotel is uh, here as well, Tony Moody. Thank, Thank you. you. We were there recently, and uh, it's a very nice looking new place. Nice job. Thank you, sir. All credit to him, none to me. <laughs> All credit to the staff. Any other proponents here today? Seeing none, any opponents? 
public hearings closed. This one does need a suspension. Yeah. Roll call. Bigley. Aye. Harding. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Thank you. Yes. Roll call. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Consent agenda. Any member of the city council may cause any item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from the consent agenda shall be taken up by the city council immediately following the consent agenda and the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by the city council rules of order. The pu public hearing on agenda items number 25 through 33 were held on October 19th. Roll call. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Aye. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. We've had two items requested to be removed from the consent agenda. Uh, so we'll remove number 46 and number 49. So first, we'll have the public hearings on agenda items number 34 through 45, 47 through 48, and 50 through 60. If you wish to address the city council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address, identify yourself by name, address, and who you represent, and if you are a proponent or an opponent. Seeing non public hearings are closed. Forty seven and forty eight to fifty nine. I'm sorry, two sixty. Thank you. I'll second that. Roll call. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Item 46, a resolution to approve change order number two with NLNL Concrete Inc. in the amount of $1,776,500 for additional work on the 2021 Residential Concrete Pavement Repair Area 3507 project. Public hearing on vote on number 46 is today. Proponents, please. Austin Rouser, Public Works Department. Just wanted to offer one clarification from our conversation this morning. This change order addresses scope that was added for additional quantities at a different location. It's 120th Street from center to L, and here to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you. Other proponents? Uh, Sean Weirs, 8535 Madison Street, uh, project manager for NLNL, here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Other proponents? Ryan Amos of Olson Associates, or Olson at 2111 South 67th Street, here to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any other proponents on number 46 today? Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Ms. Melton, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rouser, uh, I, I'm gonna ask you some questions that we talked about earlier. If you could come back up. You just have to state your name. Austin Rouser, Public Works. Thank you, Austin. Um, and at this point, is this work that's already been completed? There is some of the work in progress currently. But some of it's been completed? Yes. And there's some work in progress? Correct. Okay. So at, at this point in time, we're, I mean, we'd be obligated to pay for the work that's done we, or in the process. We would pay for work completed, yes. Okay. Um, is this common practice to add, because obviously this is a change order from the pavement repair project that was currently done between Blondo and Dodge, 120th to 132nd. Correct. It's like four different neighborhoods. And this is a change order for additional work that's being done south, I mean down, down south off 120th center, I think you said center to Elm? Correct, to L, L. Um, is that normal, is that common practice to add change orders like that to existing? It is very contract. common at, at the end of a season when, when we have some season left and we finished out contracts and we have work available and contractors available that before winter comes for us to take on additional work. And and so and that's because you, if, if you were to rebid it, it would take you wouldn't be able to get the work in. Correct. So you and you're adding on to a bid that was already 
accepted we have and approved. unit prices yep correct it's a unit price contract we have those prices established through bid and we we've, we've discussed previously that there was work that was not done to spec in the original neighborhood that this contract was done so what has been done about that so one of the the primary issue that we had in the original contract was the issue of, of sawing of transverse joints um, we did we did catch that thanks to your help and some help from residents in the area and uh, there, there has been a deduction of the contract price that's been made for that and do you know how much that is the the deduction was in the order just for the sawing was was around ten thousand dollars there was some additional remove and replace work that was in the neighborhood of forty thousand dollars so total total deductions were around fifty thousand dollars and in your opinion the fact that it wasn't done to spec what's going to be the impact on the quality of the roads then that were done in the area we may see some random cracking in the warranty period uh, we do have a two-year warranty period for it so if we see random cracking that's related to the sawing of those joints then the contractor would be obligated under the contract to come and replace at their own cost great thank you mr rouser now and this may be for um the representative from olson but we also pay and in this case, Olson Engineering, we pay a contractor a separate bid, but we have an engineering firm that is supposed to be monitoring the job that the contractor is doing to ensure that the roads are being built to the specs that were in the bid. And obviously, the Public Works Department um, uses specs that would give us good quality roads. Is that right? I mean, isn't correct. that how you determine what specs and That's correct. how much concrete to pour, what kind, the makeup of the concrete? For the specification of the contract how it's going to be cut all of those things we have very specific specs that, that are required by the contractors so what, what is this i mean i guess my biggest disappointment is that we have a contractor that's not doing the right thing we then have inspectors that aren't catching it and then we have the city that's not catching that the inspectors aren't catching it so i mean what can be done moving forward to ensure that everybody's doing their jobs correctly and that we're getting quality work done for the money that we spent i mean the voters of the city of omaha voted um, to potentially increase their property taxes in order to pay for these road construction projects that's how important good roads were to our citizens we're fortunate enough that we didn't have to raise taxes and in fact got to have a property tax reduction because of the good bond rates that we got but it's still taxpayer money that's being used for these roads and we want good roads I mean, that, and we want them to get done. So how are we holding then the inspectors? How are we holding the engineering inspectors? Don't they have some culpability and responsibility in this matter? Well, totally agree with the sentiment, Councilwoman Melton. I totally agree with the, the conversation. Um, we, we do owe it to the taxpayers to provide the best product and uh, what, what we do in situations like this is obviously we learn from it and so we have a training and communication opportunity to move forward and make sure that we get better and that you know let's say we have a 98 percent good product and we miss two percent so it's that two percent that we chase and we get better at and that's what we're looking to do and, and i can certainly let ryan talk about his perspective from olson but i rest assured that we we learn and we train and we we make the most of these opportunities where we can we can figure out ways to do things better and opportunities for training our people. Well, Mr. Rosler, first I want to, I actually want to thank you. I mean, the, the city has come out when, when I've asked them to come out and, and by the way, Sean, I know who's sitting back there from NL and L we've had multiple meetings. You've always been there, um, always been accessible. So I'm not from a people perspective. Um, I, I have found people to be everybody to be responsive to the issues. But this is such a bigger issue, and I really think it, it does come down to you've come out and met with um, some of the the neighbors that actually a, a retired engineer that is the one that caught the fact that the roads were not being done right. And I appreciate the fact that you came out and you didn't try and cover it up. You came right out and said that's wrong. I mean that, and, and I appreciate your honesty, and I appreciate the fact that you were willing to come out and evaluate it yourself but I do think since we have somebody here if I could hear from Olson um, to at least explain what your process is and maybe why the engineer the inspectors that are supposed to be there watching didn't catch the fact that it wasn't to spec do you have anything that, that you could add 
sure. you have to state your name for the record again. Ryan Amos. Uh, from Olson? From Olson, yep. Yeah, we uh, gather data along the installation and the project as far as punch lists. And we've got a punch list that's got over 100 items that will need to be addressed and will be addressed. Um, perhaps an item here or there gets missed. Um, that's understandable that that can cause some frustrations. However, working with the city and working with Austin and, and, his, and his folks, um, we're certainly working to make sure we're not missing those items. And I think this is kind of a bigger issue, and it may be what I would really like is to have an additional meeting with the the neighbors, and I would like somebody from Olson, somebody from LL&L, and Sean, I, I, Mr. Weir, I think you're always willing and available, and somebody from the city, and I would like to have one more meeting um, to explain what's been done, what steps we've taken, what we've learned from it, and what we're gonna do moving forward, and I do think we owe it to those taxpayers to have one more meeting and um, i agree with to that explain statement. that okay yep. i would appreciate that yep okay thank you You're i have welcome. nothing further thank you mr bagley you're recognized thanks mr president um we had a discussion this morning in our public works committee about this and i guess when i would discover this a couple weeks ago council member melton brought it to us and it's just frankly it's disturbing to me that the city's paying contractors to go look and make sure the work is being done to specs and had council member melton not been told about it ryan would you have found this i mean that's a simple question i guess would you have found this um flaw in the work that was done and it, it's a yes or no question would it not have been found if council member melton wasn't told about it can somebody answer that for me I do believe it would have been found during the punch list walk through the final walk. Okay, and you said some, if I heard you right earlier, you miss, sometimes you miss one or two things. So does that mean on the punch list later you'll find it? Is that a certainty? Um, I can't say that that's a certainty in all honesty, no. Okay, I appreciate your candor. And I'll tell you, as somebody new to this council, the bond that was passed by taxpayers because of the terrible condition of the roads, it's this isn't in my district yet, but I know in Councilman Palermo's district it happened because we had the same conversation. And this is really disturbing to me, frankly, that the work that you're tasked to do and that we're paying, I don't know what it is, it's a ton of money, and you're failing to meet your requirement for what we're paying you for. So going forward, um, the meetings we have, and maybe you should come to the public works meeting next month when we have it again, because I, I appreciate you coming here today but had, had council member melton not been told about this maybe we don't discover this until three years later when the two-year warranty is gone and then we're going back to the taxpayers and saying sorry you got screwed here the concrete's bad and we're on the hook to pay for it i, I just the more I, I learn about this the more upset i get and i know it's coming to district three and it's going to be in all of our districts where the roads are getting fixed so I'm gonna drill down and, and work, and again, I, I applaud Council Member Melton. Somebody came to her that had good knowledge of this and showed her pictures, and now we're here today. So I guess the good of it is we're gonna correct it, and you know that there's a microscope on you now, as there is with SNL and L, or NL and L with Sean and others. It's not acceptable. You miss one or two things to me for the taxpayers, totally unacceptable. So. Now we move forward and we try to correct this and make sure it doesn't happen again. So I'll look forward to in our future public works meetings and I'd love to come to that meeting, Council Member Melton, when you have them again, because it's good education, but I'll get your perspective. But from my position on the council, um, it's, it's not acceptable, plain and simple. So I, I, I can't tell you enough how when I knocked at doors, streets were the number one issue with people in my district. And if this kind of work is going on, then that's very concerning to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harding, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Austin, I just had a couple of process questions, if, if you wouldn't mind, please. Austin Rouser, Public Works. Thanks, I, I think you touched on this, but um, I just wanted to get a little more clarification on it. So the, the re, the change order 
um, I'm assuming, or I'm hoping you're going to tell me, is that there is somewhere in the the contract or the bid that was accepted, is there a, cla a clause that allows for additional work to be done? Yes, it's, it's, so it's a unit price contract. And what that means is that the, the price, the, the total price that's established under the contract is an extension of the estimated quantities with the actual unit costs. And so when, when the estimated quantities change to become actual quantities, that's when we arrive at the final price. And so when we have a contract that's structured this way, when we exceed a certain dollar amount or percentage, that's what kicks us into a change order. So overruns but are I common. Think that was, was the change order for additional work yes. that was not originally contemplated in the, the original bid? It's, it's extra scope that was added to the contract. What, okay, so tell me when that extra scope is added. Is it after bids are submitted and opened? It's, it's after, so the extra scope, we, we have a list of locations that we want to also pick up. Right. Don't know if we can finish them all within the contract here. So when we have opportunities like this where a contract's finished and we have additional locations. Uh, mm -hmm. We do it every year with resurfacing, all of our resurfacing packages. Um, we have a number of different panel replacement contracts we do the same thing with, and it's done essentially. Okay, so, so there are other contractors who are doing similar work. Um, so why, why was this one selected to do additional work? They had, because we have extra season. They're finished with the contract and we have more season. And no, I know, but we have other contractors. And, and we have other contractors. That that why, why weren't they offered the opportunity? They are. They, they are. are. Yeah, yeah, typically typically, typically, any contractor that, that has the availability to continue to work before the season ends, we, if, if we have money available. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate them. we're trying to get as much work as, as we can. I, exactly. I, I appreciate that fact. I just was more interested in, in the process and, and – how that additional work gets awarded post post uh, bid openings. Yeah. Does that also mean it, with that bid, how is the how is the um, engineer selected to be our owner's rep? In this case, it was Olson. Um, how, are they are they always following the NL and L projects, or how? It, tell me how that works. That, that comes down to their their agreement. The professional services agreement that we have with them, and it usually comes down to if we have money left in that agreement or not. And Often, again, so a, a contractor or an engineer such as Olson or Lamp or, or you know, TD Squared or someone, you then, th your department then selects who the owner, I'm, I'm calling them an owner's rep because right. that's kind of right. what they are. Right. You select that owner's rep engineer for the city and apply it to that or it, you put it on that project. Is they, that they typically works? follow the same contract? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palermo. You're recognized. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the rep from NLNL Concrete, if you could come up, please. Yeah, Sean Weirs, NLNL Project so, Manager. Okay, Sean, I appreciate you being here. Of course. And uh, this certainly isn't our intention to have you not bid city work. Uh, we clearly need as many contractors as we can get, but when we approve the bid, you know what the specifications are. And if you're doing panel replacement and we ask you to pour it back at a certain depth, uh, ultimately, whoever follows up behind you for whatever reason, it's your responsibility to abide by the bid that you uh, submitted to us that we approved and we have given you the contract. So we can point fingers at everybody in the room, and we know we have a lot of questions on uh, professional service agreements, but ultimately it falls on you and your company. Yes, I completely agree with that. And that's why we've taken a lot of steps to make sure that we, on our future work, are actually doing things ahead of schedule. Uh, we've purchased three new trucks that have uh, wet saws with them directly. So after we get done pouring, the very next morning, we cut those depths right out the chute. There's no questions about it. We get everything to where it needs to be. And then before we even open the road, we've already got a tarred back and everything. Um, it was a, a learning curve for me. I've been working for NL and L for a year. And there's, unfortunately, not everything is easy for me to see right out the chute. But I do learn, and I do take that, and I try to build on it. We want to be a beacon for every, every other contractor out there that this is how things need to be done. And we're going to try to do them to the right of our best ability. I mean. That's the way I've been doing it all year long. Anytime I have an issue, I directly contact the city and say, hey, can you guys help me figure out a solution to this so we can get it knocked out as quickly as possible? I mean, this project alone, 
Uh, it was supposed to take 240 days to complete it, and we had substantial completion at 183 days because I was thinking of the residents. I wanted to get out of their way before we were just <laughs> becoming a big block in the road for them all the time. So we were trying to push it and get it done, and that's why Austin, I believe, gave us the extra work was because we were able to do that. Um, unfortunately, we're on the last aspects of getting everything done in that neighborhood, but due to supply and demand, we're having some issues getting certain things. COVID kind of threw a, a wrench in everything, and people are having a harder and harder time getting supplies, like our inlets. But we are catching up, and we have a game plan to have everything completed before our 270 days are up, even on that project, while we're working on other projects. And we're getting it knocked out pretty quickly, I'd have to say. And we've been doing everything that the city sends to us. If we screw something up, we admit to it, and we try to do better and make our company better. Okay, well, after a year on the job, you sure got thrown into the fire, and I appreciate you being here. I mean, this is what we want to hear, right? We're, we're giving you the work. We obviously, with what the voters approved, we have plenty of work, and it needs to get done. Uh, but ultimately, we, we want to remind you that it's, it's your bid, it's your company, and we want you to do it right. Uh, because if you do your job right, we don't need the others behind you. And, and that's just the truth. And this is what I've been preaching for years. So again, um, how many lane miles do you think you've poured in concrete this year? <laughs> well, I, I, I know that's a tough question. It's, it's probably not fair, but you could even say um, we normally measure our concrete in square yards. I'd have to say we did about 160,000 square yards this year. Okay. I mean, we're pouring a lot of concrete. That's a lot. I've increased how much NL and L has done. Um, and to put in perspective for you, uh, my father is also a city council member down in Kansas, so I respect the fact that this is taxpayer money. I completely respect it. We actually bid this job a million dollars underneath what the original what our competitors say that they can do it for. I'm not looking to steal money from the taxpayers. I'm looking to get a job done and get it done right and get it done for a good price. And I think, you know, we did miss the cut there, uh, but when we came back to it, I saw what the issue was. We got together, we had a meeting, and I immediately went and bought three brand new saws, bought some trucks so that we could address that issue as quickly as, as we possibly could. And I will keep doing that. If I run into a problem that I missed or didn't understand properly and somebody tells me I'm doing it wrong, we'll do what we can to fix it as yeah. quickly as we can. I, I appreciate that. And again, uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, is it Olson, Ryan, with Olson, I want to ask you a question if I could. Name and address, please. Ryan Amos of Olson at 2111 South 67th. So as you heard me say, this truly falls on uh, the person that uh, is awarded the contract, which is NL and L. Uh, but with the way the city's growing, we, we have another step in the process. And you mentioned the, the punch list. And when people hear that, when I hear punch list, I think of uh, you built a new home and the bathroom mirror is crooked or a piece of tile needs caulking or a, a wall didn't get painted properly. But when you say punch list on panel repair, ultimately the only way you know if that punch list was completed or not is by failure. Because once you pull the panel out and it's graded out and there's a base put in and you pour the concrete where all the different specifications come from, you're not gonna know unless there's a failure. So um, we know this falls on the bidder, but the city's paying uh, professional service agreements to engineers to make sure if there's oversight. If maybe for NL and L, the, the main foreman went on a lunch break and the person who's taken over maybe doesn't have that experience, this is what you're here for. But it didn't happen in this case. And I, and I have to believe out of the 160 cubic yards, or I'm sure that's not even right, that was poured, it's not the first time. So the city's paying a lot of money to these engineering firms for these professional service agreements, and I just don't feel the job's being properly done. So do you have anything to change my mind? Uh, yeah, we have soil densities at the panel replacement locations, and we do have concrete break strengths, and we do have technicians out there testing densities and testing concrete prior placement. So tell me, uh, 
NL and L's here, panel replacement, uh, the concrete's uh, broken up, tore out, uh, the, the base is ready to go, the, the concrete truck pulls up. Uh, what, do you, what do you do? What is your checklist, your journal? What does it tell you have to do to protect the city's investment in the roads? Like, what are your, what are your steps? What are we paying for? <coughs> our, our, um, our steps are such that we will have a soils density technician out there verifying the density of the, of the backfill if there is disturbed soil underneath that panel or if it looks suspect. Um, and we will ch verify the density of the soil and make sure it can withstand the load of that new panel. And then we will, following the specs and the special provisions provided and the city specs, make sure that that concrete placed is coming from the uh, proper and approved batch plant. Um, we will test it for air. We will test it for moisture and, and cement ratio. And therefore, um, once we gather that data, we provide um, early breaks, a three-day break, to see if that concrete has made 75% strength before we can open that roadway to traffic. And if it doesn't, we'll typically do a seven-day break. Typically, it's a seven-day break. Um, but in situations like this, when we we're trying to get the road open, uh, we'll, pull, we'll cast an extra cylinder so we can get an early break on it in hopes that it will get, make strength. And then once it makes 75% design strength, we can open it to traffic. So our folks are verifying all that information on a daily basis, as you can imagine, we're pouring a lot of panels back. Um, so we do verify that, and we do give that release to open that lane. Okay, so let me ask you this, Ryan. If, uh, if there's a problem, if something doesn't check out, do you reach out to the city project manager, or do you go back to NLNL and say, hey, we have a problem, we have to redo this? How does that work? We go to NLNL first and work okay. with that, work with NLNL and ask them to replace a panel. How often do you do that within a month's time? Across all the projects that we have, I'd say probably 10 times a month. And I'm talking, we've got 40 technicians. So we're testing a lot of concrete in a lot of various locations. It's not uncommon. Okay. All right, well, hey, I, I appreciate what you do. Uh, obviously, you've heard me say this whole process needs revamped. Uh, there, there's flaws in it and especially with the amount of work that we're gonna uh, ask everyone to do moving forward, uh, we all need to stay on the same page uh, for the good of the cause, because roads don't last forever, even if they're poured perfect. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, no further lights. has been done or in the process of being done, and I think um, Mr. Cousy, our city attorney, would recommend that we approve paying for work that's done so that he doesn't have extra work in getting sued for us not paying for work that was done. Um, so I appreciate everybody coming down um, to discuss that. Initially, I think we had talked about laying this over so that we could talk to um, Olson and so that we could talk to NLNL uh, so, Ryan and Sean, I appreciate you coming down today so that we don't have to prolong this. Um, so I am going to move to approve payment for the work that's been done, but I, I just, I hope that both the contractor and the engineers are going to start paying more attention, because I know all of us here are going to be paying more attention um, to all the projects, because this, the, we owe it to the taxpayers, all of us, all of you sitting there, all of us sitting here. We owe it to the taxpayers to make sure that the job's getting done right and that we're getting quality job for what we're paying for. Um, so thank you, and thank you for agreeing to have another meeting in regards to this particular project. I appreciate it. There's a motion to approve. I second. And a second. Roll call. Bagley. Aye. Hardy. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Item 49, a resolution to approve the professional services agreement with Shamir Associates in the amount of $60,000 to provide professional services on the residential snowplow inspectors 2021-2022 winter season. Public hearing and vote on number 49 is today. Any proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. 
so yeah we we have another professional service agreement in front of us um, where we're gonna hire a contractor uh, to watch a contractor uh, and maybe the specs and the details and the job nature aren't so intense with plow and snow because there are tech there are a lot of technicalities that go into uh, pouring concrete it isn't just as easy as I explained earlier that they tear it out and a concrete truck pulls up and they pretend it just automatically goes flat but with snow removal it really is that simple it's a person in a truck a truck that probably doesn't have the right weighted blade uh, that probably drives too fast to be able to plow the snow and ultimately the snow is either there or it's not there so we had a group of these last week and we always stress to people not to repeat themselves so I'm, I'm not I'm not going to I'm gonna try a different angle to get my colleagues to uh, reconsider and and you ask why councilmember Paul's one here when he was here he brought up these professional service agreements all the time and uh, and he was serious about it because when the budget is presented to us the budget is presented to us there's, there's not a lot of room and we all want things done in our district so moving forward I'm gonna make sure that I find something in there each and every week that probably doesn't have to be in there something that doesn't have to be in there where anybody's city services suffer okay um, we have contractors because we want to get into residential areas sooner um, and a lot of people say well wait a second the, the main drags are running water curb to curb but it doesn't matter because I can't get to the main drag because I can't get out of not only my driveway I can't get out of my uh, neighborhood and so what happens is uh, a complaint goes into the mayor's hotline or to us or to our staff and once the snow flies the phone rings like uh, we're giving something away free and, uh, and I, I will read what I read last week where we had over 8,000 snow issue complaints just through the mayor's hotline over the last three years so my question is if we're paying a contractor to plow the snow and they're doing the best of their ability because they're not actually a city employee in a properly rated truck with a snow plow that can go curb to curb they're probably just making a pass or two uh, they're not worried about getting close to cars and if somebody moves their car they're certainly not circling back um, is it worth it to have these people out there we're up to 300,000 now I can ask any one of these directors behind me if they could use 300,000 in their budget and I guarantee you what each one of them would say I, I can guarantee what each and one of us uh, my colleagues would say if we said hey we got 300,000 to give to a nonprofit in your district spend it any way you want they would use it and so would these directors uh, we've heard we need more money in the libraries we need more money for violence intervention we need more money for city services so if we're not truly going to invest in city employees then what's the point do we want to keep giving money to contractors contractors that they're just checking if somebody plowed a street or not we heard that the foreman ones were too busy and uh maybe they are but I wonder how busy they would be if they weren't 45 or 50 people short in that department so if street maintenance is short AEO ones and twos and threes and MR twos and that's what keeps the foreman one busy what are they doing with the worker shortage maybe they could actually go out and check these residential areas because it's not just a form and one in snow operations when we're under a 12-hour clock um, I don't know so I'll ask I'll ask director Stuby. I think he's here yeah hey Bob um so the question is say we take a, a street maintenance district yard in my district uh, which is Dayton about 52nd in Dayton and uh, say we're under a 12-hour snow emergency 
uh, at any given time, tell me how many foremen are are there sitting in the office. Bob Stuby, Public Works. Um, I, I guess I can't tell you how many of the total foremen because we have foreman ones, we have foreman twos, and we have foreman threes. Uh, foreman ones are kind of that first entry level into a supervisory type position, but they're also based on their job classification considered as a working member of a crew. So normally during the summertime, those individuals would be part of either concrete crew or an asphalt crew or something like that, and so they're working as part of that crew. Part of their job description also includes uh, during snow events that they're supposed to schedule. So when you have an individual that is operating a truck, uh, the foreman one is, is probably in the office handling scheduling that. If there's an issue with a breakdown of pieces of equipment, they're supposed to handle scheduling, getting that particular piece of equipment uh, repaired. They're also responsible for timekeeping and things like that associated with uh, the employees that are working with them. So if, if we have 15 individuals, uh, that would equate to essentially about three per yard. And, and I, I can't tell you if that's the exact number, but we have five yards, so uh, three per yard. So you would have at least uh, one foreman one on a 12-hour shift and another foreman one on another 12-hour shift. So they're continuously working uh, during that particular snow removal operation. Okay. And it, 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 is that fact, or are you just as, assuming it's only one? Because I have different information that it's more than one. I just want to be clear that we're telling people how many foremen are at a district yard during a snow operation. Well, and, and again, I indicated that we have 15, and I'm going based off of what's budgeted numbers. I'm going based off of what is the number of district yards. And, and again, if we have 15, there's at least one individual as a foreman one that's working on that particular 12-hour shift. Okay. So well, when that 12-hour shift has ended, there's another 12-hour shift that starts there would be another form and one that potentially would be available then for that second shift when we go into a 24-hour operation. And sir. again, when we're not in a snow operation, as I mentioned previously, uh, they're, they're, they're a working person, um, you know, as part of that particular crew. So again, if, if the snow is not falling when we go into shifts, uh, that particular individual is part of that working crew doing other things. Okay, how about a form and two in that yard? Uh, I, mean, I can't tell you how many foreman two we have. I don't have that information in front of me. Uh, there would be five foreman three. Uh, there would be foreman two that would be available, and, and as I indicated, the majority would be foreman ones. So let's say in my district yard and street maintenance in a 12-hour operation, it's, it's during the day. It's noon to midnight, uh, and we could have a foreman one there, a foreman two there, and a foreman three there. Uh, and the work foreman that you classified as a work foreman, he's not actually working on equipment. We do have city mechanics under a bargaining unit that actually work on equipment, correct? Correct. I'm, I'm not saying that. They're, they're a working member of the crew. So, again, if, if the crew is out in the field and let's say they're doing a concrete pour, they're, they're part of that crew that's actually doing the concrete pour. So, besides being in a supervisory role, they're also part of the crew that's actually doing the work. So the foreman one could be assisting with backing the truck up to make a pour in, in a particular location. They could be uh, running a float to, to, to float off the concrete. They could be screeding, uh, as we talked about earlier today when we met as a committee. So there's a number of things that they could actually do. They also have the ability, uh, I believe, under their job classification to operate equipment too. I, I, I was talking in particular during a 12-hour snow emergency, and I, I surely hope the foreman one isn't out screening concrete uh, when the snow's flying, but I guess no. it is a possibility. No, they're not doing that. During a, during a snow operation, they are actually working uh, actively with regard to the, uh, the snow operation. So again, they have multiple trucks that are out in the field handling uh, different routes, and so when those routes are completed, those particular foremen are responsible for scheduling. They're responsible for, if, a, if an individual comes in and says, hey, there's a vehicle broken down, they're supposed to coordinate getting that particular vehicle repair. If there's materials that need to be, they're responsible for materials. So they're responsible for a number of things specifically related to 
uh, that that snow operation. Okay, thank you. And, You're welcome. And, and as a reminder from uh, a meeting back, we uh, realize there's no openings at the foreman level at the city, so it's it's a really good job. Um, and if there is, maybe there's a new one now. Uh, but there was a lot of openings for those actually driving the snow plows. So if I know during the day, colleagues, that you have three foremen there to help supervise without having a professional service agreement, then here's our chance to save $300,000. I mean, it doesn't get presented often when you're presented a budget, and that's what it is. And it's not a knock on finance. They work incredibly hard. Uh, to, to work and, and make sure the city's operating. But it's our job, as we know, uh, with we, what we just had, where we had a contractor here who didn't perform their professional service agreement. Um, this one's not even near as technical as the past one, which things were missed. So with the 8,212 complaints we had just to the mayor's hotline alone over the last three years, I didn't make that up. I got it from the website. Here's our chance to save 300,000. And if nobody has an idea where to put it, I have a lot of ideas where it could go to actually help our constituents that ask us to find ways to help them during the year. And when they say we want help, they're not saying help by approving professional service agreements with engineering firms that people make a hundred plus dollars an hour. I could talk all day on this, but ultimately people are gonna have to vote and your constituents want you to make the right decision. They want you to take care of, of this money and this is not money well spent. And if it is, then you won't have any complaints this year when it comes to residential snow removal. But if you do, don't contact me because I'm trying to figure out a way to make it better. Council actually, member. You, actually, you can contact me. I don't want somebody to take that the wrong way because that's what people do. Still contact me, but I'll remind <laughs> you of how we didn't save $300,000. Council member. Yes, Director Stubbe, one Thank more you. question. Uh, appreciate it, Bob Stubbe, Public Works. So just a couple points of clarification. One would be is that similar to a panel repair type project, it's based on quantity. So if, if no work is done, heaven forbid, if we don't get any snow, uh, no payment is made. It's only paid for actual work that's, that's done. So if we call out uh, the residential contractors, we would pay them in that particular case. If we don't, if we don't call out the residential contractors, we don't pay them. Um, also, when we budget for snow removal, we budget for numerous things, and, and one of the things that we budget for is outside services. So that's incorporated into our snow removal budget. And then to keep in mind, too, is that that particular funding source, uh, there's restrictions on that. So it can only be used for certain things because it's uh, gas tax money. So you, um, I, I know that there's other departments would like that, and I'm, I'm sure they would, but we're restricted with regard to under state law with regard to what we can use it for. Thank you. Yep, thank you for the clarification. Let me ask you one more question, Director Stubbe. Yes. Uh, if you didn't spend that money, where does the money go? Well, we're fortunate within Public Works, uh, and that's a little bit different than other uh, divisions where their funding kind of zeroes out at the end of the budget year. Um, our, our money is in uh, kind of reserves, so we, we like to have a reserve, and so I'll give examples of when we might need additional funding, um, a, uh, a, a tree storm or something like that, where it's an unknown, it's an unbudgeted type of uh, action that's required by uh, public works, we've got funding available for that. Uh, for example, if there's um, additional um, uh, major street resurfacing that can be done, as, as Austin indicated earlier, is that when we add additional project locations, if there's funding available for us um, that we have in reserves, we can use that funds for additional resurfacing projects on major streets. So those are some of the things that, that, that uh, we would use that funding for if we have excess funding. And, and no different than we might budget a million and a half dollars for salt. We only need a million dollars because we have a low winter usage. We'd have a half a million dollars available that we could use on other things such as 
uh, resurfacing and, and other types of concrete work. Thank you. I have a question for the finance department. Don Drives the City Finance Department. Hey, Don. Um, I don't have time to look it up, but can you tell me of this uh, separate fund that Public Works has and where I could find it? it it's in the budget book. So, well, what's it classified under? Street and Highway. Street and Highway. Funding. So the, the, the general fund's budget is put into Public Works, and any money that's extra goes back into the Street and Highway if it comes from the general budget? Could you okay. clarify that again? Say Public Works needs $50 million operating costs for the year, and they don't quite use all the money during the calendar year. Let's just say we don't get any snow, and that would be great because we would save all that money. But you've already allocated the money to the Public Works Department. So are you saying that if they don't spend all that money, they put it into the Street and Highway Fund, and it's Public Works' own little fund? No, the money that funds the Public Works Department, the majority of it comes from street and highway and sewer revenue. They're only, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the general fund portion uh, funds um, our, our solid waste program and... Graffiti program. Oh, the graffiti program. So very, very little of the general fund um, goes to fund any of the Public Works programs. Okay, sorry about that. Threw you under the bus a little bit. Uh, so $300,000 could be saved, but it would remain in this public works budget. Uh, I will correct myself, even though every other department could use this money and it, they could get it from general, the, the general budget, but that's fine. So we're still back to me asking my colleagues to reconsider saving the citizens of Omaha $300,000. Yep, you would save the citizens of Omaha $300,000 if you would reconsider. Uh, city Attorney, I'm going to pick everybody before this is over. Yeah, could you do law department? Hey, Matt, could you tell me um, how long would my colleagues have to reconsider saving the city $300,000 on the items that were approved? last week. If I recall correctly, the prevailing party would have to make the motion. In terms of the exact amount of time, I'll defer to my friend, the clerk. Madam Clerk, it's your turn. So she can have a turn, too. Uh, council member from the prevailing side could make a motion to reconsider. At this point, it would require a supermajority vote. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we, we still have time, folks. Uh, and it, it doesn't have to happen today. We're, we're going to take a vote today on this one that didn't get grouped in with the rest. Um, but you're going to hear more and more of these professional service agreements, how we pick them apart. And again, if there was wiggle room in the budget, uh, maybe it would be different. But unfortunately, the budget is presented, and it's our job to find a way to save money. So uh, with that, there is another light. I don't think I've called on everybody yet, but I still have some more questions, but uh, I'll give up the floor, Mr. President. Councilmember Harding, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'm gonna look at my crystal ball here for a minute and um, ask the clerk a couple questions. Uh, before I go there, though, uh, I guess uh, I'll ask Director Stubbe. So last week we did approve four of these and so those, I'm assuming, are for different areas of the city. Each, each one covers a different area, correct? That is correct. So I think this is the fifth one. So there's five district yards, and right. so we, we have five different uh, consultants that we bring on board to, to handle that inspection work. So I'm not sure um, which, which district would this one cover, do you know? I think it's district one, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. All right. Okay, so now I'll, now I'll go to my crystal ball questions for, for the clerk. Because someone's absent today who, who did vote in favor of the other four last week. So let's assume if there is a vote to deny and that were tied, 
um, then there could be a, a motion to approve, and it's, it could be a, a, an outcome that you have a 3-3 tie, so I assume it doesn't pass, correct? Correct. Who, who is on the prevailing side in that situation so that it could be brought for reconsideration at a future date? Those who voted no. And also the council member who's absent could reconsider the motion. Right, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, before I give up the mic now. Um, and, and so in addition to being on the prevailing side, if the motion to reconsider, I think our council rules state now that if it's to be reconsidered, um, it would take a, if it's not brought up at the next meeting, which it hasn't been, that it would take a super majority to, of the council to bring it up at a future meeting, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, no further lights. Is there a motion? Motion and a second. Roll call. Begley. No. Harding. Pass. Johnson. No. Melton. Yeah. Palermo. Sorry. Yes, he passed this week, but not last week. Uh, no. Mr. President. Yes. I get it. Santos passed. Harding. No. Motion fails. Two to four. Next item, 61, please. Item 61, an ordinance to approve various purpose and refunding bonds, tax exempt series 2021A, and general obligation refunding bonds, taxable series 2021B, in an amount not to exceed $168,400,000. A is amendment of the whole requested by the finance department. The vote on number 61 is today. I would note the amendment of the whole. Is there a motion? Second. Roll call. Begley. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Item 62, an ordinance to approve a major amendment to the Roanoke Boulevard Mixed Use District Development Agreement Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on number 62 is today. The applicant, please. I'm Kyle Hazy with ENA Consulting Group representing the applicant 10909 Mill Valley Road. Uh, along with myself, uh, Brent West and Patrick Mohall, part of the development team, are here as well in the audience to ask any questions or answer any questions that I might not be able to cover. Uh, the project that we are looking at is in the southeast corner of 120th and Roanoke. It's outlined here in the orange. Um, it's approximately 7.7 .7 acres and is currently part of the existing Roanoke Mixed Use Development Agreement. Uh, we are requesting amendment to that uh, existing agreement. Um, previously, within this 7.7 .7 acres, <coughs> there's been a mix of different uses. Uh, this is one of the, I think, the light, latest one. Um, there was a mix of uh, retail, office, a bank, and senior living previously proposed um, at the site. What we are in front of you today, uh, as part of our amendment, we are proposing A six building uh, multifamily project uh, with uh, 237 units. Uh, there's a mix of two story and three story buildings. Uh, building in the middle is the storm shelter um, with four units above. Uh, that is a two story unit. And then also we have a two story building on the east edge. Uh, we place that there as kind of a, a buffer between the uh, existing residents uh, to the east. And, um, and then the rest of the buildings would be the three story units. Uh, the buildings have front doors and resident access to all the surrounding roads and sidewalks and all the garages are facing inward to the project, not to face outward within the neighborhood. 
Um, there's a clubhouse on the east end or on the west end of this building along Roanoke Boulevard. Um, it'll have a pool, uh, a patio area, and then it connects to a 10 foot trail that we have along this main road that will connect to the ball fields to the south and then also uh, to any future development and uh, retail or office uses uh, to the north to help support those uh, businesses. Um, Dan Mohall uh, has had direct contact with the, some of the neighbors and the neighborhood association um, over the, the months that we've been working on this project. Um, he did reach out again to the neighborhood association and the neighbors about two weeks ago to inform them um, of this meeting to make sure they were aware. Uh, we have not heard anything back from them. Um, I don't know if anyone's in the audience today or not. Uh, with that, I'll make myself available for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Any other proponents that want to speak today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. I just was curious, what neighborhood associations or homeowner associations did you contact? Um, we connect, uh, contacted the ones to the east. Um, on top of my mind, I do not remember which, what the name of that association is. Is it Roanoke? Okay. Roanoke Neighborhood Association. So you only contacted one? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Ms. Milton, you're recognized. And I know we've been talking about development in, in around this area. Um, very pleased that we were able to get the turn back tax through the legislature on this past year for um, tranquility. Um, so uh, I think that this is just another sign of um, development in this area yeah. and, and getting excited about development in this area. And what I appreciate and the fact that we don't have a whole bunch of people here and that I haven't heard um, any complaints mm -hmm. um, from the neighborhood is because of the job that you have done um, and that the moles have done yes, they've been in, very... in reaching out and also taking their, the steps of making a two-story building and the buffer and then putting all the landscaping, which the neighbors know will be nice because it's going to come from most likely from yes, moles. Exactly. Um, and so what, what you've done is you've taken all of those steps to make sure that it's on the outside of the neighborhood. You're not affecting the neighborhood. You have the buffer. And so that I, I just appreciate all of those efforts. And I know that the people who live in Roanoke uh, appreciate those those efforts too. They have a very active um, neighborhood association mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I just want to thank you and your team for doing that. And I think that this is an excellent location for this multifamily housing project right on 120th. And I think it'll encourage even more development in that area. Uh, I, I agree. It's just kind of the start. Yes. So, thank you. And I'm oh, sorry, I can't move to approve it today. It's just public hearing, but sure. I will be making a motion to approve it next week. Okay. Thank you. No further lights. Next item. All right. Thank you. Item 63, an ordinance to approve the blue stem phase one and two tax increment financing redevelopment agreement. Public hearing on number 63 is today. Proponents, please. Ms. Hadley. Good afternoon, Bridget Hadley, here to answer questions you may have. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Larry Shore, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. Um, I'm opposed to this because I'm kind of wanting affordable for who? And why is there's no city participation in this one where there is in others? But I also want to make a complaint to you, Mr. Fester, from today under the Open Meetings Act that I can hear Amy, El Amy Melton just fine, but I cannot hear most of the rest of you. And it's a long afternoon without being able to understand what Mr. Palermo says. How many times do I have to say this? I have no problem usually in the morning. They had their mask on today, so I had a little problem. But there's always a problem in the afternoon, but not with Amy. Couldn't hear her. Most people were probably not here because they can't. Why say it all afternoon and not be able to understand what you're saying? And that's it. That's a nice little smirk, Mr. Perlona, but I heard very little of your long dissertation. Thank you. And I don't have a problem hearing you fellows when you comment to me as I'm walking away. 
But of course, you can invite me to stay at the microphone and discuss it. Thank you. Any other opponents today? Seeing none, public hearings closed. One public hearing can be held for items 64 and 65, ordinances to amend section 23-177 of the Omaha Municipal Code by adding the employment classification entitled Grant Manager and Grant Assistant Personnel Board recommends approval. Public hearing on items number 64 and 65 is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon, Deb Sander. City HR Director here to answer any questions that you have, along with Claire Anderson Hubbard, who is our HRIS and Compensation Manager. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Are you a proponent? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Luis Jimenez, 2709 Dewey Avenue. I'm a proponent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Bagley, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Deb, a couple questions for you. I'll try not to throw curveballs at you, but these positions here that you want to change, tell us why you want to do that. We, we had a discussion in our committee last week, I think it was, just the reasons why you want to do this. So on item number 65, there are two positions that currently exist within the SimTech classification. And we're just retitling those two positions from grant writer to grant um, assistant, and then the grant um, administrator to assistant grant manager. So those are just retitles and a little bit of adjustment, so that way we're in line with the with the market and how the market structures. Um, the number 64, item 64, is the creation of a new job called uh, grant manager. And um, over time, the amount of grants and the number of grants, the amount of reporting, the requirements for the reporting have increased exponentially. So there's federal grants, there's state grants, there's local grants, there's um, the grants that you all approve that are Omaha community grants, um, and all of that has to be monitored. So we are looking to create a grant manager position. We do have someone that's in a not, it's an unclassified position now. Um, to classify all of these particular jobs so that way you have continuity of operation. Right. That's, that's what I was looking for. I appreciate <laughs> that answer. And as I've learned in this position, those grants are vital to help the city budget and other things. Is that fair to say? Um, yes. Um, I have, oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's more than $15 million. I have to look here at my cheat sheet. Um, just with uh, some of the awards, um, over $15 million um, and some with additional uh, funds, there's more than $5 million. I have an entire listing. So it's millions of dollars that come and go through the city that, again, have to be reported on. Um, all of the different grants that have different, whether or not they're federal, state, or local, have different reporting requirements. And if you miss your reporting requirements, then not only do you lose your funding, but they want that funding back that they've already paid you. Right. And I, for um, on the board of a nonprofit, I certainly can understand that aspect of it. So I appreciate the, the good work your team does, and I'll support this today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palermo. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I want to apologize for to anybody. My microphone was on five. Usually it's on seven. So I did turn it back up. Uh, Deb, I wanted to thank you in HR uh, for this position. Um, we know how important this position is, and it's tough when people leave. They have to play catch up. We've had it here at the city recently, and, and those who are in this world of grants know how important uh, to to whatever company you work for that you have a, a grant writer that's there and, and showing up every day and, and uh, putting in the work. So uh, thank you for protecting this job, and uh, I'm I'm sure whoever. Well, I think we already have a, a grant manager. We're not applying for a new one, and I think I know who she is. He, she is, but she's on vacation. I think she'll appreciate the uh, salary range adjustment as well. So, um, thanks and for it's this in one. line with the market. Yeah. Our salary ranges, yes. Thanks for this one. Thank you. And just one follow up on that comment too. Having worked in the mayor's office, I understand the desire to do this. I think it has some merit. Um, but anyone currently in this role, 
who might seek this new position has to refile for that position and go through the personnel process, right? It's not. That is correct. It is a competitive process because it's a classified service. Right. I think that's important to note just so folks know that this abides by all the personnel rules the city has and there's no one that um, is becoming a civil service employee automatically. They have to apply like everybody else. Correct. Yeah. All right. Thank you. No further lights. Next item. Item 66, an ordinance to approve the Highway Safety Programs Grant in the amount of $95,000 during the project period of October 1, 2021 to September 30th, 2022. Public hearing on number 66 is today. Proponents, please. See none. Any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 67, an ordinance to approve the Drug Enforcement Administration Grant in the amount of $58,116 during the project period of October 1, 2021 to September 30th, 2022. Public hearing on number 67 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 68, an ordinance to approve a lease purchase agreement with the City of Omaha Public Facilities Corporation for improvements to the riverfront revitalization area in the amount of $70 million in lease revenue and refunding bonds. Public hearing on number 68 is today. Proponents, please. I believe we have the finance department coming down to give a little overview of this item. So Don Draz of the city finance department. Uh, I'm the proposal before you right now represents new money as well as uh, refinancing money. The new money is for projects that have already been approved, um, in, either in the CIP or through resolution or ordinance. Um, for example, computer equipment in the amount of 675,000, the police helicopter, 3.1 million, uh, the SCBA mass for the fire department, $2.3 million, uh, some lawnmowers and other equipment for parks in the amount of 385,000, uh, 20 million for the riverfront project, uh, and then 38 million for refinancing. If you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. It was a large number and a little bit unusual in terms of having some things put together, but all financed under lease purchase bonds and all previously approved projects, right? Correct. Or the refinancing? Yeah. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Non-action items, item 69 through 116, do not require public hearing or city council consideration at this meeting, but will be placed on a future agenda for public hearing and or vote. The reason for non-action is noted after the item on the agenda, as well as the date the item is expected to appear on agenda for consideration. Second, roll call. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Meeting is adjourned at 335.